Good day. Welcome to week seven, day two of our World 50 Days of Freedom. And today uh, we're looking at broken pottery. And Isaiah chapter 30, verses 13 and 14 is our text for today. And um, we're looking at the potter and the clay this week. <clears throat> the sin, verses 13 and 14 says, the sin will become for you like a high wall cracked and bulging that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery. Now, today is an important continuation of what we did yesterday. And uh, we looked at Isaiah chapter 30, verses 18 to 21, and James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25, which talks about the law of liberty. I just want to recap what we did yesterday. Number one, um, a rebellious child of God doesn't act like a child of God. Two, a rebellious child of God isn't willing to listen to the Lord's instructions. Three, a rebellious child of God prefers pleasant illusions over truth. And four, a rebellious child of God relies on oppression. Now, I want to continue our look on Isaiah uh, 30, 8 to 21. And uh, I want to look at verse 12, uh, verse, verse 12. It says in verse 12 here, Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, relied on, re relied on oppression, and depended on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall cracked and bulging and collapses suddenly in an instant. So number five, number five, a rebellious child of God depends, depends on deceit. The Hebrew word for dependent, uh, is to support oneself, to lean against. And if you've ever seen someone walking with a walker or a crutch, you would understand what this word means. And so it says here in verse 10, they relied on oppression and they depended on, on deceit. And so they're interdependent. They're interdependent. Anytime we attach ourselves or seek safety in a fraudulent savior, we have to depend on lies to support the habit. The following story can say, uh, contains a picture tragically experienced as a reality, as a reality in someone's life. A young Christian girl has a harsh, abusive father. This is pulled um, from the book of Breaking Free. I, I pulled this, this story. She grows up with a fear and distant, and, and she grows up, excuse me, with a fear and a distaste for men. Satan supplies a slightly older woman who seems tender and very caring. The comforting relationship turns into a physical relationship, so the young woman assumes she must be homosexual. In her heart, she knows what she is doing is wrong, but she feels helpless without her new comforter. Soon, she starts socializing with other women who are practicing homosexuality because they will support her new habit, the lies she needs to continue. She avoids the Bible and chooses books that advocate homosexuality. She drops all relationships except those that support the fraudulent attachment she with lies. Scary, isn't it? I used an obvious scenario to make my point. But Satan uses countless unhealthy attachments to things or people. Interestingly, the lost world enjoys characterizing Christians as needy people who use faith, faith as a crutch. Well, how wrong they are in John 5, 8, Jesus encountered a man who was lame. Christ didn't hand him a crutch. He says, get up and walk. And that's what the Lord wants to do with us. I want you to take your Bibles and I want you to uh, probably pause this video. And I want you to read Jeremiah chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, and Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4. And the Bible it will describe to you these verses apply to depending on deceit. And I want you to get that picture in your mind and get that picture. That's Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 5 and 6, and Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 4. Um, but uh, I want to go to verse um, to number 6, our sixth point. And I'll, I want to give you a formula, a formula that can help us as we move forward today. Number 6, a rebellious child of God runs from the real answers, runs from the real answers. In verse 15, in verse 15 to 17, listen to this. It says, 
My eyes, my eyes. This is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. You said, no, we will flee on the horses. Therefore, you will flee. You said, we'll ride off on swift horses. Therefore, your pursuers will be swift. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you will all flee away till you are left like a flagstaff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. Have you ever experienced a season when you knew what would rest, what would rescue you, but you ran from it? Perhaps like me, you may have, you may rank these memories among your greatest regrets. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15, the word salvation is not used in a strictly eternal sense. The word represents being saved or delivered from any kind of calamity or attack. Now, here is our formula. I said we're going to have a formula. It is in repentance and rest equals, equals your salvation. Come on, y'all. In repentance and rest equals your salvation. Eternal salvation requires that we repent of our sins and depend on the work of Christ. Our need of deliverance does not end, however, once we become Christians. We've been eternally saved, but we need lots of help avoiding the snares and pitfalls on the earthly journeys. The same equation applies in repentance and rest is your salvation. The word returning more accurately translates the Hebrew Shabbat. The, the word repentance used elsewhere in God's word usually means returning from sin. But often we omit the next step. The next step is what helps us and keeps us from going back to the same sin again after we have repented. We see this important twofold process in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. If we only turn from our sins but not turn to God, we lack the, the power to overcome the temptation the next time it arises. The word returning in Isaiah 30 verse 15 encompasses both repenting and returning to God. Now, let's look at the second variable in the equation, in returning repentance and rest. Is, is your salvation. So we return, uh -huh, uh, we repent, uh -huh, and then also we rest. The word rest means what you think it does. The Hebrew word nakaf, strong dictionary, gives a definition, uh, a wonderful definition. It says a word means lighting down, lighting down. Isaiah 30, 15 is telling us that in returning to God and resting confidently in his promises and power, he will continually, we will continually find salvation. I love the Hebrew meaning for the word salvation, yasha, which means to be open, to be wide, to be free. It is the opposite of star, sarar, um, which is to cramp. The shot draws the picture of a spacious place in which to move. Are y'all with me? I have personally experienced the wide open freedom, hallelujah, of obedience to Christ. I've also known the miserable pinned down feeling of being a rebel. We all know that God wants us to return and rest. But what kind of equation would tend to? Would, would, would tend to be more readily reflect the practices of our past because we want to do everything in our own path, in our own strength. But I want you to know what strength means in this verse. The Hebrew word implies victory. I deeply desire to be a victor, don't you? Two primary elements are involved in victory, quietness 
and trust. The original word for quietness, as we read here, is shakwat, meaning to lie quietly, be undisturbed, to calm. Notice the disturbing phrase concluding Isaiah 30, 50, but you would have none of it. Can you relate to that statement? Unfortunately, I can. The exact Hebrew word translated trust in this verse appears only once in the Old Testament. Not here. The word bitcha means nothing more that one can do. Once we've obeyed God, and I wish you would throw your hands up where you are right now. Once you have obeyed God, you can do nothing more. <sighs> Come on, y'all. Once you have obeyed God, we can do nothing more. We then wait on him to bring the victory, knowing that the consequences of our obedience are his problem, and it's not ours. Our human nature is to run when we're in trouble. But we've learned two very important concepts and precepts from Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. First of all, to flee from God's salvation is rebellion, and to flee from God's strength is to flee from victory. God wants to respond to you. His response is already in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. I, I, and I love it. He, he longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. We can picture God being merciful and forgiving when we accidentally get ourselves into mess. But we almost cannot imagine how God can be compassionate when we're outright rebellious. But God wants to be compassionate even when we are rebellious. To end today's lesson, let's read Isaiah chapter 30, verses 12 to 14. What happens if we continue in rebellion, rejecting God's word, relying on oppression, and depending on deceit? Look at this. Therefore, this is what the Holy One of Israel says. Because you have rejected this message, relied on oppression, depended on deceit, this sin will become for you like a high wall, cracked and bulging, that collapses suddenly in an instant. It will break in pieces like pottery, shattered so mercilessly that among its pieces, not a fragment will be found. For the taking coals from a hearth or scooping water out of a cistern. You see, the figurative walls of protection around us, around our lives, will crumble like pottery broken in pieces. Thank God that God still loves cracked pots. Let's not wait until we're in pieces to return and to trust. May this word find good ground in your life today.